welcome to another episode of the Storied Way Perspective. Today, my guest is Susan Farrow, therapeutic storyteller, author, consultant. Susan lives in Australia and for the past several years has been working in the field of therapeutic storytelling, using stories to heal. Now, as a storyteller, I strongly recommend that you use stories to find a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the world that you live, live in, and to find a little bit of hope and resilience from the stories you consume. All stories heal, but we know as storytellers that there are certain stories that have a way of intricately working into the listener's mind to give them the kind of support that they are looking for, the kind of support that they know they need, or the kind of support that they don't know they need at this particular time. Susan tells talks to me about her work with therapeutic storytelling, of how stories work with listeners and especially children. How can you use therapeutic storytelling to talk about behaviors? She takes us through her books and she promised me that uh, she, 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 before we started the conversation, she said we're not going to, we won't have the time for a story, which was fair enough, but she landed up showing us these precious stories from her story bag. She loves the name Your Story Bag because it aligns with a story that she tells. Uh, it's a story from Africa and she was generous enough to share it with me, which I hope I will share sometime during the conference, The Story Way. All this and much more in my conversation with Susan Perro. If you're a parent, you're a storyteller, you're a listener, you're somebody seeking stories, you don't know whether what can stories do for you when you surrender to the power of a good story go ahead and listen to this conversation. Susan also has a word of advice for storytellers who are looking to tell stories to heal other listeners. So listen to this conversation, this precious conversation with Susan Perro. Hello, Susan. Welcome to the Storied Way Perspective. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to speak to you this morning. We are five and a half hours away from each other and I I'm a little sad and upset that I will not be able to bring you live to listen to people, for people to listen to you during the Storied Way event. But this interview with you is an absolute delight and I'm looking forward to uh, just listening to you answer some of my questions and opening the door to healing stories and therapeutic storytelling for a lot of our audience. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Great. So let's dive in. So Susan, okay. um, you know, as a storyteller, I have a uh, you know deep connect with the healing powers of a story. We both know that stories heal and all kinds of stories heal. And no matter which story I tell, a lot of things I'm very aware that, I'm always aware that there are certain changes that are happening in my body, in my mind, in my heart, while I am telling a story. Can you just tell us something? For a lot of people who've never ever told a story and I want them to consider, just stand up or sit down and just share a story with someone. Your friend, your, your partner, your daughter, your child, your, your anyone in your community, an unknown person on the train or to work, on your commute to work, you just share a story. I want you to sort of help people understand how does storytelling help the teller? And most importantly, how does then the story help the listener? Well, any kind of storytelling, it taps into to something um, deeply human. I would say that storytelling is integral to our humanity. And so when we as a teller share a story, and I would suggest, as you have said, start off just with one person. In fact, I'm sure everyone already does this. We may have some incident that has happened and we meet with a friend and we share this. That's a little bit different to an actual sculpted, framed story that you might tell a myth or a folk tale. And also when you do tell a more um, formal story, it's, it can be scary. Um, it may need a lot of practice, but something, um, in fact, sometimes even for me, yes, it can be healing, it can be empowering, but most of all, it builds this connection to all the audience, uh, a little bit like weaving um, invisible threads, the eye contact, the listening of focuses, so much more than if um, I was reading a book, because with the book, 
um, the, the book comes between me and you. However, please don't ever think that we shouldn't read to children because that is also a wonderful human activity. But when we are just telling, there is something that um, lights up with everyone. And in today's modern time, it is hard for people to focus. There is so much busyness in the world. And yet when the storyteller has a group of people in front of them and makes that wonderful eye contact, that really helps develop our concentration. It's especially important for children because concentration levels are actually getting worse and worse by the year in schools. So, yes, I encourage you, of course, give it a go. Even invite just two or three friends. Start, start small. Um, and there was one other thing that felt really important to say. Oh, oh yes, of course, there is an organization across the world called Toastmasters. I'm not sure if you've heard of them in India. And as one of the important strategies for anyone giving a lecture or a speech, they will say, start with a story. Because the story grabs the listener's attention because it speaks to the imagination. It speaks in picture language. Yes. And this is, I mean, most religious leaders, they knew that. Most religious leaders, if you study religions around the world, you will find they spoke to the people, they shared their pearls of wisdom, not through giving lectures, but through telling stories. Yes, Fantastic. there's so much there. I mean, there's so much there. We can keep going on about uh, what yes. does storytelling do and what it does for the listener. Let's talk about the special thing about uh, you know, there are certain stories that listeners crave for, particularly when uh, they are going through a moment of grief, pain, it could be, uh, you know, the human mind is already full of these emotional turmoil, lots of thoughts, lots of feelings, which they are difficult to contain. Now, at that point of time, what does a story do? How do we know that the person going through grief is ready for a story now particularly mm. because it's all imaginary it's all feel mm -hmm. good and you know those kind of things it's easy to dismiss a story at that point of a time for the list absolutely but how yes. do we really get in with the story at that time well my main focus is therapeutic stories and at the basis of this therapy is the art of listening and observation and you really need to listen to your friend or the family that you know is grieving you really should never push a story onto that person or group of people. You may be asked to share a story at a funeral or a memorial. That is different. They have reached out to you. But otherwise, I don't think we should ever think that a therapeutic story can do any healing in times of grief and loss. I think the best way I've found to talk about it is that perhaps a therapeutic story can offer a whisper, just a tiny whisper of help or of hope. But only you can judge when is the right moment and be so sensitive about that. Perhaps you may, I mean, I'm not trying to market my book, but this is my most recent book up behind me, Stories to Light the Night. I think it's actually my most important collection because perhaps you may just gift a collection of stories to someone. Or if you have written a story for a friend or a family, perhaps you might illustrate it. You could roll it up in a little scroll, you could offer it and you could say, perhaps you may not be ready to read this yet, but when you are ready, put it in your cupboard and when you are ready, you will know. That way you are being the sensitive, caring um, story offerer. Uh, Susan, I'm coming into, uh, I'll put in a question right here, though it's not there, the, the kind of questions I said I'm going to ask. Sure, uh, that's all right. My, am I, um, right now, my family is going through a period of grief because we lost a cousin. And every time there's a death in the family, 
you know it's very uh, it, your mind goes back to all the memories that you've lived with that person yes or the or the lived stories the experiences and and uh, it's i i totally believe that in the end we will all become stories because we will have stories yes. which are left behind and those same stories i drive a lot i i derive a lot of uh, comfort from thinking and recalling all the good memories all that good time yes good time. I, and and that's wonderful you mentioned that because it reminds me one of the stories in this book that's sitting behind me is the memory treasure box and it's actually a story that could be used by all ages and it's about a queen in a kingdom that is dying and the king gathers all the the children all the grandchildren um around the queen's bed it could also be about a king it could be about any main character but one of the grandchildren they just um the other children go off and play in the gardens but one grandchildren is feeling grand grandchild is feeling really upset and the gardener comes and helps him um make a beautiful wooden box and in that box he invites the boy to put in the memories to put in perhaps a yellow feather that reminds him of his last walk with grandma when they saw a yellow bird flutter by or to make a drawing and put it in the box and then he takes the box around and all the other children at their memories and then the adults join in and they perhaps a teacup or a piece of jewelry and they put them all in the box and then the whole family after the queen has passed away the whole family sits around and they each share their memory stories now that sharing memories is one of the most special ways to remember someone who has passed yes and a story like this encourages it sort of helps encourage what is difficult to speak about and it gives it a place to speak absolutely absolutely yes. and a lot of time i tell i also tell people be aware that one day you will go and you will leave behind a legacy of stories make happy memories live uh, yes. more meaningfully mindfully yes. in your present so that when you are gone people remember you with a large number of stories so the grief will never will never be uh, will never overpower their life beyond yes of course okay but perhaps a family may not be ready to do that straight away and this is where the sensitivity comes in yes and there are many more like that there's 94 stories in this book some for loss of a pet some for to do with environmental grief and loss there are many forms of grief and loss in our world today unfortunately so and so stories can be a wonderful um a medicine story medicine is the best way to describe it yes you talk about story medicine i i call it you know healing stories because we crave for stories all the time sometimes yes. we know it sometimes we don't know it and our lives are so connected uh, we are uh, at every point of time we're looking for some meaning behind what we are doing mm -hmm. and how we're leading our lives uh, talking about your book susan i you have an immense body of work uh, as far as healing stories are concerned could you share something about where and how can people go searching for healing stories especially the ones that susan perro writes I have print books that are available in bookshops or online. Many online bookshops share um make these available. Um unfortunately they're not that cheap. Um however, each of these books, the Healing Stories book has 80 stories, the Therapeutic Storytelling book has 101 stories, the Behavior Tales has 42, and then this last book has 94 stories. So even though they're not cheap there is a huge collection in each of these books and also in each of the books is a lot of theory and tips and techniques on how to write your own therapeutic story because the stories that i'm sharing here they're only a tiny part of the possibility there are thousands of situations in our world today that are calling out for a story for that specific need and i think as in indigenous cultures for thousands of years people used to make up stories to guide and teach 
the children and the adults. And I think we need to encourage ways to get back to that. I'll just quickly share this one um, for people who can only afford to pay a little bit less. There is this ebook series and especially the last one, a spoonful of stories, number four for parents of very young children. This is a very practical book. There's a 25 or 30 stories in here for all those everyday challenges that anyone who's been a parent knows. Toileting, bath time, table time, tidy up time, hair brushing time. There's a lot, there's quite a bit of humor in there. Um, so that's a really good resource. And they're just a few dollars, each of those. So there's a little bit um, of marketing that I don't always feel so comfortable with, but you asked the question. So Yes, no, I wanted people to know because I would have put the links to your work because sure. uh, there are a lot of storytellers uh, who are looking for good, meaningful stories to connect with children. And there are parents as well. Um, so recently a storyteller in one of my workshops, she, she wrote a story about tidying up and, and doing basic behavior of brushing the teeth, you know, combing her hair. Mm -hmm. And she, wrote a, she, she likes writing stories. And uh, there were problems with her story and she felt that the story was meant for the child, that the child would listen to it and would start combing her hair and start brushing her teeth and cutting her nails on time. And I said, no, no, the story is not for the child. The story is for the parent because the parent <laughs> yeah. wants to... Often that is, often yeah. that is the case, of yes. course. Yes, the story yes. is for the parent, which the parent will then use to, to talk about these good behaviors of that the parent... Of course, wants. of course. But um, if I could just take this opportunity a, an effective therapeutic story will not have lecturing it yes. will, will not have moralizing it will not have what i call teacher talk you Absolutely. let the journey of the story do the work the journey Absolutely. of the story speaks to the listener and the journey might take the behavior from being quarrelsome and whinging um to a more um contented approach. I was just with three of my grandchildren just two days ago and they had been complaining quite a bit in the car, car journeys and so on. And at bedtime, um, often we pull out my A to Z of behavior tales because they like it because it's got little illustrations in it. And I read them, Quibbling Queen. And my oldest grandson, he just sighed at the end Yes, I don't have time to tell you that how the journey takes this queen who's always complaining through to the end where she realizes she actually sees her and listens to herself in a mirror room and can realize this is this is terrible that I'm always doing this. What a waste of time. Yes, so it really touched especially my eldest grandson. All right. I uh, you know I I from where I come and when the way I use stories, I, I'm a strong believer of the fact that stories have immense power. They will do what they have to do now or later. Uh, sometimes yes. the child finds himself or herself into that story. So yes. the, the, what he or she is going through, uh, he may not share it with the adults in, in his environment. But when he sees another character in another story, a make-believe story, a make-believe character yes. in some other part of the world, going through what he or she is, uh, seeing that uh, really releases uh, 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 something which has been knotted inside. Let's talk about needs and special children. Yes, but if I could just add to that, this is why um, children all over the world should be exposed to a vast body of stories, fairy tales, folk tales from different cultures, because every story has the potential to, to be a therapeutic or a healing story, but every story will have this journey where there are obstacles that are overcome, that it's really good for soul development, for character development. And children, um, especially if there's too much screen time and television time in the household, please to parents at bedtime, put them to bed with a folk or a fairy tale. Age appropriate, of course, you can't just, um, share any kind of story with anyone. I write, write about that in my first book. But the more we are exposed 
to all of these story journeys, we learn so much, so much um, character and soul development for our, for our life and our way forward. We can't give too much. Of course, if you always just talked in story language and you didn't talk in a rational, intelligent, intellectual way, that would be unbalanced too. <laughs> but today it's too much the other way, too much information, always explanations. And often we can just story our answer. Perhaps a child doesn't want to put their shoes together by the door. And I know that's very much a custom in your country. It's a wonderful one. Perhaps they just throw them any direction. You could just say they are, they like to be friends together. You're giving them a picture and you will be surprised what a difference that makes instead of saying, well, you need to develop a good habit. You need to, you know, especially some parents, that's a naughty thing to do. Put your shoes together or they might bribe them. If you don't put your shoes together, then when we get inside, you're not going to have your favorite food or, you know, there's, there's so many strategies that miss out on this essential story language approach. And I really encourage you, um, especially parents. Well, Susan, you mentioned about uh, talking about everything in story. Uh, a few years back, we had, I don't remember what was that incident, but my husband wanted me to talk to my son. He was perhaps five, four or five. And uh -huh. he said, no, I want you to talk to him and tell him that, you know, this is what is important and blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, it's okay, I'll do it. And he said, no, 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 I don't want you to tell a story. I want you to go straight <laughs> and do it. <laughs> no story this time. I know you will try uh, you know, sure. wriggling in a story, but go do straight talk. And I said, I think you should do the straight talk, not me. Yes. <laughs> well, sometimes straight talk is needed. If you're about to cross yeah. the road and a big truck is coming down the road, you're not going to try and make uh -huh. a storied approach to have your child hold your hand and be safe. Of course not. But there are many times, and that's why that um, that little e-book that I mentioned about storing every day, you know, brushing the knots out of the hair. Could be a niggle naggle knot man that's hiding inside. And how are we going to um, get that niggle naggle knot man out of, the, out of the hair and send him on his way? A bit of nonsense, a bit of humor, Yes, absolutely. You talked about having the storied approach. That's what the storied way uh, the event is all about. Yes. Having a story to Good. address everything. Let's talk about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, needs in children, emotional needs, which arise due to certain uh, life experiences. You yes. mentioned about the book you wrote for uh, children who, who were affected by tsunami. Uh, yes. We know uh, about the little gnome who had to stay indoors. You wrote it during times of COVID. Now there are these life experiences which children are, are unable to cope with. They're unable to talk about it. Yes. They're unable to express themselves. Uh, could you talk a little bit about these stories for these special circumstances in a child's life? Well, there are so many special circumstances in a child's life. If a child is lucky, they may get from naught to 21 and not have many um, challenging, what I call challenging situations. And this is no judgment of like parents divorcing. I was a parent who divorced my first husband. This, it, this happens and it is quite traumatic for children. And of course, there are many strategies that you need to put in place in a situation with divorce. Ideally, you would want both parents to continue the same consistent routines and rhythms so that the child is feeling really secure in both homes. But also a story can speak to that. I have one on my web. I give quite a few stories away on my website. And I have one about a little fish that lived in a pool, a rock pool with all brothers and sisters. But then there was a big storm and the rocks cracked open and some of the fish went into another rock pool. And in both rock pools, there was a soft seaweed bed to rest in. And there was a song where the little fish would travel back to the other rock pool. I mean, it's a metaphor, one home and another home. And the little fish would travel backwards and forwards through the crack in the rocks to visit both homes. But in both places, there was a little song there's the consistency of the daily rhythms 
all of that is important. And sometimes these stories are actually giving messages to the adults and not just the children. Yeah. yeah. So that's one situation. There could be children who have nightmares and possibly for good reason with all that's going on in the world. So perhaps some kind of, well, actually many kinds of soothing bedtime stories that don't have um, strong obstacles. They may just have maybe about a bird putting its baby birds to sleep in the nest, depending on the age group, of course. There can be other huge challenges. There was a teenager that I helped the mother make a story for, 17 year old teenager who had lost the use of her, uh, of her legs. She had a disease that was getting worse as she grew older and she refused to have a wheelchair. The parents had bought the wheelchair. The girl was so depressed and so angry and the mother wrote a little story and it was the story that encouraged the girl to accept the use of the wheelchair. And the story wasn't anything about a wheelchair. You see, this is the, the wonder of therapeutic stories. They are in metaphor. Yeah. The story was about a heavy stone necklace that the girl had inherited from her grandmother. The grandmother had the same disease. That wasn't talked about in the story. But this stone necklace that as the girl grew older, the necklace grew heavier. And when she was ice skating, it started to pull her to the ground. When she was trying to walk up steps, the heaviness pulled her down. And one day, the necklace pulled her down right to the ground and she couldn't get up again. But when the necklace crashed on the ground, the large stone broke open and inside was a beautiful amethyst crystal and the light in the crystal shone out and whispered, I can show you a new way. Now that was, the, the story was only half a page long. The story doesn't, didn't provide the answer. If the story had said that the crystal had said, I think you should use a wheelchair. And no, you know, this, when you speak in metaphor, you have to stay in the, in the story pictures and then you let those do the work. And the next morning, after the girl had read the story, she called out to her parents and said, I'm ready. I met her six years later in Zagreb in Croatia. She'd come to visit me with a big bunch of flowers on her lap. And she was sitting in her wheelchair and she proudly told me she's at university and she's now an advocate for disability services. And she has helped them put ramps up to all the rooms and an elevator in the main lecture hall. A story helped her on that pathway. And her, believe me, her parents had tried so many strategies to get her to use that wheelchair. And sometimes a story can shift through. That's an extreme, wonderful example. And I have many more, but we don't have time in an interview. But sometimes a story can shift where nothing else or can make a pathway where nothing else can. But also, sometimes a story is not the strategy. So please not, let's think that therapeutic stories can help everywhere and everyone. But to not um, use story medicine as well as other strategies, I think we're ignoring our humanness. It's, an, it's integral to our humanness to work with stories. And that's why, I love the, that the work that I do. And it took me 30, 35 years to really discover this. I did not like writing, creative writing at school. I was a mathematics student. So I, I love the way you uh, talked about, uh, you know, we, we agreed that Susan, we're not going to talk, tell stories. That's all right, that's fine. Stories, but you are no. telling stories. You can't take, a, take away stories from of a storyteller. Yes. And I think that, that's wonderful. Recently, yes. I got a call from uh, 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 you know somebody who was going through a bit of a difficult time with her niece because her niece is uh, uh, you know uh, is a teenager, two years of COVID, lots of things have happened yes. in her life. And when I when I heard her aunt talk and tell about her niece, I sort of felt that you know just the story medicine will not be enough. No. What she needs is in a is somebody who handles us 
you know psychology as well as understands where to intervene and how and the right time to use that story medicine so i sure. refer her to one of my storytellers who's a trained psychologist and a storyteller uh, saying that this is the person you need to connect with because she's going to balance the both parts of the intervention so here's my question to you which is uh, stories heal and like doctors healers therapists they have they create a bond with the listener uh, and they have a place in sorry they have a bond with their patients and yes. they have a place in their patients life do you see storytellers becoming that kind of uh, an important person in people's lives where they reach out to a storyteller just because they want to be heard they want to hear mm-hmm. something from them i yes. have experienced such moving incidents of people just calling me up they've followed me uh, they followed my work they've heard my stories they've heard me mm-hmm. in front of me and they call up to share their life stories with me difficult marriages difficult parenting and they are crumbling they are breaking but they just want to hear me say something to them mm-hmm. and i have i and i'm getting goosebumps while telling this to you susan mm-hmm. that i feel there is a huge immense responsibility to accept what i can do as a storyteller yes. and what i cannot so from mm-hmm. a seasoned a practitioner and a uh, somebody who talks about therapeutic storytelling i want you to uh, give your piece of advice to storytellers like me who mm-hmm. meet people uh, like this when they are vulnerable when they are shaken when they are looking for help mm-hmm. what are the ethics of storytelling in this way mhm mhm i love every part of this question and it's too big for me to answer but there's certainly some some answers i'd like to share um first of all i think the attitude of a story therapist let's call um if we dare to call ourselves that or a therapeutic storyteller it should be that of humility let's not think oh yes i can heal that with a story i can help heal that with a story let's think perhaps a story can make a difference even if it's a tiny difference now just that attitude change um is that's a starting point the other um advice is give it a go um perhaps start by writing a story for yourself that's a good starting point or for a friend that you feel comfortable to share with give it a go be respectful be sensitive don't push your story onto anyone but if people come to you and they ask for a story which is what happens more and more in my life i get emails um asking for stories for a particular situation an 8 year old boy who's been swearing at his mother or um um another family that has had a huge separation and the very and the father is not even allowed to see the children because of violence there are many different situations that call on this um then i think if if you are asked then um well there are many trainings that you can do i would suggest that would be a pathway i'm not just again marketing myself because there are many ways to make therapeutic stories i certainly offer a training i offer them online in your country last year i did three different um three separate trainings because it was such an interest and i'm happy to to have someone coordinate that again um in, in as i said in my books is quite a lot of theory and tips and techniques and then there's also something that people if they haven't heard of this word bibliotherapy Have you heard of this? Yes, I yes. have. So for your listeners, they they could google this. Bibliotherapy. It means healing through books. There are master's degrees at some universities around the world in bibliotherapy. And I just in my local area there is a, a doctor, a general practitioner who has also trained as a bibliotherapist. And people go to see her if they've got physical needs you know or they need medicine like real medicine that you take on a spoon or a pill she'll give that if it if it's more emotional needs she will um as a bibliotherapist she might recommend you should read this story you should read this novel 
maybe you should read this poem. Um, all kinds of literature, not just um, the kind that I write, because my stories are more about making new stories for new, unique situations. But a bibliotherapist may recommend a fairy tale, a folk tale, a full length novel, depending on the age group, a picture book for a child. There's even some bibliotherapists who've put out full um, advice collections where they give advice. You've got someone who has broken their leg and they, they're immobile for six months. And you sort of look that up in the index, um, immobility. And, and then there's stories to read to help develop patience and acceptance and so on. So that's something that's worth investigating. Not everybody is a reader, uh, but everybody is a listener and everybody yes. can consume sure. stories. So you have to, uh, uh, while you're working with storytelling, be aware that where is your next story coming from and who is your listener and what will, what will really get them to consume a story, maybe orally from you, maybe by reading a book, maybe at their own pace and then when the time is right for them. They may not like a story thrust in their face, they may like a story which they choose to consume and when I say consume, whether hear it from you or read it from sure. a book or watch it somewhere. But when they are ready for that story, that's where a healing story is most effective. When someone sure. is looking to be healed. So and it's, and it's good if I could just end with, with, um, with this, um, because I have a special announcement. As you said, not everyone is a reader. Um, I'm very soon launching an app that will be for phones and tablets and and there will be audio versions of all of my stories on this app. Wow. And um, an app developer in Europe is doing all the work. An illustrator is doing beautiful little illustrations for each tale. Um, the stories are in age categories and also um, different challenges. Stories for challenging behavior, stories for challenging situations like we've talked, the special needs stories. Um, Resilience tales, stories for environmental grief and loss, soothing bedtime stories, stories for everyday challenges. So there's many categories. It's going to be very easy to navigate. And um, anyone who's um, on my, I don't have a sort of newsletter I put out, but because you're on my email list, you'll get an invitation and you can share it. There'll be an online launch in the next few months. Fascinating. I think that's what we all are looking for. We're looking for meaningful stories to uh, share, to consume, to uh, to you know keep in our on our desk when the time is right. And I think Susan's stories are like that. So thank you, Susan, so much for uh, spending this uh, evening with me. And I'm absolutely delighted. Like I say, it's it's my uh, 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 you know, it's my loss that we people will not be getting to hear you live in the storied way. But in the storied uh, way, uh, through a week long event, there are lots of sessions which are meaningful for parents, including one on mental and uh, social well being, uh, emotional yes. well being. So you must come and listen to other speakers. We have special stories for special children. And we will continue this conversation about how to use stories for. Uh, you know, better living at the end of the day, no matter what you do, where you do, and how. Of Did you enjoy this uh, conversation, Susan? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I wish you well in your conference. And I love that you have this story bag image, as I <laughs> shared with you in my second book. I've written a couple of pages yeah. um, connecting with my work in Africa and the story bag story. So maybe at some point you can share I would that. I, I said, I want to tell it. And, yes, I, please. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll share the story with you. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do it as a video and, and share it uh, at the conference because I want people to hear it. Your story bag has a story of its own. There's a reason yes. why I have a bag uh, as, as my logo. And I, I strongly recommend everyone should have a story bag. You already do, you don't know that. You yes. just have to fill it up with the right kind of stories uh, that make oh. your life more fuller and more meaningful. Thank you for that Lovely. story, Susan. And I would share Thank that. you. Thank you so much. Thank for you.